to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. We have talked about what an Air Force officer should be, someone who is worthy of special trust and confidence of their commission through their character, competence, and connection. We've discussed how those things might or maybe should be measured and evaluated. But next, we need to talk about our vision of how the Air Force should recruit, assess, and train people to ensure that they have those qualities. Yeah, for sure. So this is like the natural next step in the conversation moving from defining what it is, how you measure it. Now, how do you get it? How do you produce the thing that everybody wants in the Air Force, which is a quality Air Force officer who is worthy of that special trust and confidence, right? Exactly. So we think that the best place to start this conversation is not necessarily with the recruiting process itself, but around the requirements what needs to be in place before you can qualify for what's called an original appointment to receive a commission as an Air Force officer. And we've talked about these before, especially a couple of weeks ago in the rebroadcast of what is an Air Force officer. We want to remind everybody that the ultimate source of the commission is the Constitution itself, specifically Article 2, Section 2, where it talks about the president being the one who is given the authority to appoint the officers of the United States under the approval of the United States Senate, right? Exactly. And ultimately, the requirements, the basic requirements are outlined in Title 10 of U.S. Code. Let's quick review. You have to be a citizen of the United States, have good moral character, you are physically qualified for active service, and... You know, the thing we're going to spend our most of our time on today, Colin, is this last point. Has other such special qualifications as the secretary of the military department concerned may prescribe by regulation? So what does that mean, Reed? The rules that we've set for our own club. Yeah. Okay. So these are the things that you have to do, the boxes you have to check in order to receive the legal authority of the commission, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so we've talked at length about these different requirements and... I don't know, Reed, what do you think? Do they need to change? Do we feel comfortable with these? Where are you sitting with these four requirements? Overwhelmingly, no real change, except for that last point, the rules that we get to set. I mean, right now, without question, you need to be a citizen of the United States and you have to have good moral character. I mean, those are yeah. no questions asked there. But it's the physical side of things, as well as the special qualifications that the Air Force has designed. That's what we think might need some addressing. And that's what we're going to talk about some of those this week. Yeah. But even before we get there, Reed, I think, you know, I've brought up multiple times before that I don't think that good moral character is very well defined, certainly not in the Title 10 requirements here. It just says good moral character. But, you know, in other governing documents, like in AFMAN 36 2032, I don't see anything in there that tells us what is meant by good moral character. Well, that's fair. So why don't you take a stab at kind of defining that? Because you've thought so long and hard about it, you know, show us what you've kind of come up with. Okay, well, so this is still pretty rough, but I think it's a at least a good first step. You know, kind of like the 10 ALQs and the ACA addendum, those are a good first step. And I want to put it out there to the public sphere, get your take on it, get members of our audience to say what they think about this particular definition of character. And, you know, you and I have had multiple conversations about this, both on the pod and offline. But so you know that it's hard to really settle in on a one single succinct definition of character, right? Certainly. Yeah. And so what I think that is the best way to approach this is you will have good moral character if you can honestly and appropriately answer the following questions. So the first one here is, do you or are you willing to, if you have not yet received the commission, 
support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Pretty simple question. Basis of everything that we do as officers is all about supporting and defending the Constitution. And then it continues, do you accept the Constitution as the supreme law of the land? And I like this one because it gives your allegiance and your acceptance of the law to a document as opposed to a person. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Something we talk about in our class about the commission, right? But both at ROTC and at OTS. Yeah. And also the Constitution is supported by the laws, you know, the rest of the federal laws, such as Title 10 but also you know, the laws of the different states where you live in. And so there's a requirement there for you to be a law-abiding citizen. Mm-hmm. So I think that one belongs in there. Next question, do you sustain elected officials in their constitutional roles and responsibilities? Now, this was a tricky one as I was thinking around it because we don't want our officers to put themselves in a difficult position of being publicly involved in the political arena, right? Exactly. We want them to participate in the political process, but we don't want them out there wearing the uniform, waving their flag, saying, I, as an Air Force officer, support this candidate or this cause or whatever, right? But it still shows that we have a responsibility to support the people, the individuals who are elected to office, whether we agree with them or not, right? Yeah. So long as they are fulfilling their constitutional role. Yeah. This system that has created the positions and the offices by which these people are filling. So I think that one allows for us to participate in the political process, but not have to agree in every wit with those elected officials. So there's that one. Next is, do you strive to be honest and equitable in your thoughts and behavior toward yourself and others? And I include yourself and others because I do think you need to be honest with yourself and others, right? Yeah. You have to have both in order to truly function effectively as an Air Force officer. Next is, do you support or promote any teachings, practices, or causes harmful to the United States or its interests? And this is meant to be kind of like a catch-all, you know, do you support fascist or anarchist overhauls of the United States government or something like that, you know? Yeah. Which, given the current environment and the Defense Department directed stand down to address extremism. Um, This kind of question is not, you know, out of left field. This didn't come out of nowhere. Right. Exactly. Next question is, do you have any financial or other obligations to any financial or other obligations to any foreign government institution or other entity? Now, this was in my mind meant to help you realize that it's not that you can't have a relationship with people outside of the United States, but If you find yourself in a position where you're financially or in some other way legally obligated to a foreign government, that can be a really dangerous place to be, especially if you're involved in high level, highly classified information or operations. Best to limit those types of relationships so that you're not a risk to what we need to do as an Air Force and as a country. And then the last question here is, do you consider yourself worthy of the special trust and confidence of the American people and to serve them as an officer of the United States? And this one here gets into our conversation from last week about you being the stakeholder of the character evaluation. Yeah. And this is your opportunity for you to literally declare your worthiness, right? You are the one who best understands and knows your character, and you get to be the one who says, yes, I am worthy of my commission. Yeah. So those are all the questions that I outlined that I feel capture, at least in part, the character that matters for Air Force officers. Yeah. Colin, this is really interesting. You know, we've talked a lot about how it is so challenging to objectively measure character. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's not a, a concrete thing that you can literally walk up to someone and be like, okay, you are six feet tall. That is your height, right? You know, it's easy to objectively measure. You can take academic tests and use that as an objective measure of their competence. But character is a lot harder. I like how you said it. This is almost your opportunity to declare, this is my character, and almost use this as a physical witness 
it is the objective measure. And at some point I could see this being brought forward, you know, in an Article 15 or, or some other type of experience where you've given reason for others to doubt your trust and worthiness. And they can bring this forward and say, look, you said that this was not an issue. Yeah. You know, I think that's really interesting because especially, you know, the ideas of being true to yourself, this character thing, it's so important, but we're still trying to wrap our arms around it. I, I really appreciate you, you know, going out there and, and kind of giving us this some thought. Yeah. I mean, I'm certain it's not 100% correct, but like I said earlier, I do think it's a good first step and it gives us something to have a conversation about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's super important. So that there kind of defining what is meant by good moral character and our acceptance that everybody who becomes an officer should already be an American citizen. We accept those two. But we kind of alluded to the fact that we do have some sort of a disagreement with the physical qualifications and the service defined requirements. Yeah. And to be really clear here, we don't disagree with any of the things written out in Title 10. It's more on how the Air Force goes about its portion of this, you know, as defined in, right. in AFMAN 36 2032, enlisted an officer of sessions. They list out the minimum eligibility requirements. We've talked to those before. And overwhelmingly, most of those were fine. For example, being a conscientious objector. Yeah. Right. That is something that does not align with being a successful U.S. Air Force officer. And age limits and things like that, those generally make sense. But we would like to discuss physical requirements, physical fitness in particular, and the requirement of a bachelor's degree and just the overall structure of our commissioning sources. Yeah, absolutely. Those three things are first and foremost in our mind of where the Air Force can make some pretty significant improvements in the way that we produce quality officers for the Air Force and for our airmen. That said, I think we do need to hold off on the discussion around the fitness program because we think that it deserves its own episode, right? It's a big enough topic. I mean, it merits its own position in the law, right? It's a, it says right there, must meet the physical requirements of active service. And so we're going to hold off on that one for a later date. But here's a shameless plug for everybody. The Barbell Logic podcast released an interview that I did with them just this week about the Air Force's fitness program. And in there, you can hear many of my personal opinions, again, not as an official representative of the United States Air Force, about what the Air Force is doing, as well as how things are changing in the military's fitness culture. So I invite everybody to go check out the Barbell Logic podcast, the military series that they just released this week, and you'll be able to hear some of what I have to say there as kind of foreshadowing for the discussion that you and I are going to have later, Reed. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Colin, you and I, I know, have very strong opinions about the physical fitness program, <laughs> as does any officer. You're right. I mean, who are we kidding? Officer and Lizzie, it doesn't matter. Anybody in the service, you want to get a conversation going? Yeah, just, you know, pull that proverbial grenade and throw it in a room of people. Yeah. Hey, what do you think about the fitness requirements? And just, just watch it stir, right? <laughs> it gets pretty heated. But like we said, we're going to hold off on that. We're going to focus on what commissioning should look like. Colin, you and I were products of this system. Mm -hmm. We were then parts of the machine. And there's some things that we would like to discuss. We want to get into the nuts and bolts of what the Air Force should do to produce officers. And I want to be really clear. We are not blaming anybody. We're not saying all the officers that have ever been produced are terrible. We just think that we can be better. And we think that the country deserves better. And we think we've got to accelerate some of this change or we're not going to be prepared for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Let's quickly remind everyone of the current situation, how everything is set up to produce Air Force officers. We've done deep dives into each of the three commissioning sources, Air Force Academy, Air Force ROTC, Officer Training School. And so we're not going to rehash all of that here in depth since we have it elsewhere. So if you're interested in more of those granular things about the different commissioning sources, go check out those episodes. But even so, Reed, I think that it would be good for us to provide at least a broad overview, a little bit of a refresher, starting with the interview that you did with David Rowe about the Air Force Academy. Yeah, happy to. So 
the United States Air Force Academy, Colorado Springs, it is the first and highest priority commissioning program, meaning that is the first place they're going to go to establish their priorities and get the best and brightest. The Air Force Academy recruits essentially the Ivy League talent, extremely high performing individuals that start really young. Yeah. Dave talked about how you need to start thinking about this really seriously, you know, junior, senior year. They're recruited via a variety of mechanisms like admissions, liaison officers, and the Gold Bar program, as well as lead for some, a few enlisted members that are able to leave the enlisted corps and go to the Air Force Academy. You get your bachelor's degree and your military training at the same time. This is for those who are accepted a no cost tuition experience with one of the best educations you can get. This is regularly the service academies, the Air Force Academy included, are regularly considered in the top, you know, extremely low percentile of high quality educations, especially for value, but it still costs a lot of money to send an individual through that program. If you've never been to the academy, it is a beautiful place, a really special experience. Most often the folks that commission there are going into the rated career fields. Most of the other AFSCs will get a few folks from the academy, but by and large, they go rated and they go line. And all of these folks go active duty, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, absolutely. So that is the Air Force Academy. Similar to that, I'm going to cover Air Force ROTC. It is the second commissioning program. It is second in priority. So whatever is left by in terms of what's needed for numbers and AFSCs by the Academy is then filled by Air Force ROTC. And we'll hear just in a little bit, if ROTC can't do it, then OTS is going to pick up what's left. There are 145 detachments serving over 400 different universities across the United States and Puerto Rico. ROTC is designed to cast the widest net and have the highest volume of input. And so what this actually ends up looking like is they also has the lowest barrier to entry. If anybody wants to get a commission and they meet the minimum requirements of service, if they go through ROTC, they're probably going to be able to finish the program and receive a commission. Not guaranteed, but certainly it is the easiest way to earn your commission. The cadets that go through the program are recruited by admissions liaison officers who also like you mentioned, Reed, work for on the academy admission side, but they will also provide information and steer cadets into ROTC. They are also recruited by Gold Bar lieutenants who spend their first assignment out of ROTC recruiting others to join the program, as well as the cadre at the detachments themselves. There's usually a recruiting officer who actively goes out and tries to bring people into the program. Just like the academy, you will earn your bachelor's degree, or maybe even a graduate degree, which is different from the academy, right? But you'll earn your degree at the same time as you receive your military training. And most of that training is going to happen at the school itself, at the university where, where you're pursuing your academics, as well as a single field training event, which is currently 14 days. We may see that length of time change year to year, depending on what's going on within ROTC. For the pursuit of that bachelor's degree, there are scholarships available. And so like the academy, there may be a high dollar value attached to you going through the ROTC program, but scholarships are not required and not always given. The balance of those who graduate from ROTC are going into both the rated and line communities with some very limited ability to go into the non-line career fields, such as nurse or JAG officer or something like that. Also, like the academy, the vast majority of graduates are going into active duty. But unlike the academy, there is some limited opportunity for graduates to receive appointments into the Guard or the Reserve. Awesome. As Colin mentioned, the last and most flexible of the commissioning sources is Officer Training School at Maxwell Air Force Base. It is absolutely the last priority. If the Air Force Academy and ROTC left some room on the table to fill positions, that's where OTS comes in. As a result, there's a pretty high barrier to entry because there's more often than not a lot of people trying to apply for a very limited number of slots. And the number of slots and positions available for training can vary widely. While I was there instructing, we were teaching at almost 150% of capacity because the Air Force was hiring. Yeah. And it's a much quicker way to get officers in. 
when I was going through, it was quite the opposite. Selection rates were in the single digits and they had canceled some classes. They weren't holding some selection boards, kind of what we're experiencing now. So, you know, really wide range of class sizes, of AFSCs that are selected for. There have been entire classes of nothing but pilots and entire classes that don't have any of the other AFSCs. It's a really flexible partner in the whole scheme. Most of the students are generally older. So first off, you have to have your degree before you show up. So right there off the bat, you get much older people. Yeah. The average age is actually 27 of a student going through OTS. A lot of them have prior enlisted military experience. And as a result, you tend to have a more mature audience. Uh, these folks are recruited by officer accessions recruiters at installations all across the country, you know, just normal recruiting centers, and then also the base education centers. And again, there are always more applicants than there are positions. It is not a hard recruiting problem to get officers to go to officer training school. It often takes a really long time to get into OTS. Most applicants will apply multiple times over a period of years before they get selected. And along with that, there are often very extensive waiting times. It's not uncommon to be waiting for an entire calendar year or more for your training spot once you've already waited for a year to get into, you know, for a year or two for selection. So it takes a long time. Virtually all AFSCs go through OTS. Very flexible and again, dependent on the needs of the Air Force. And we commission a really big balance of active guard and reserve officers. So we have quite a swath of, of trainees that come through the program. Yeah. So three different commissioning sources, three different ways of recruiting, three different ways of doing accessions, three different ways of training. Reed, this strikes me as incredibly inefficient. It doesn't make sense in my mind that we have one way of producing 90% of the airmen that go into the Air Force through Lackland Air Force Base, basic military training. And yet here we are for officers, we have all these different ways of producing essentially the same product, right? And we've had this conversation before. I, I get why we have the three different ones, diverse populations being recruited, different perspectives that are then brought into the Air Force. I get all that. But again, it's incredibly inefficient, not just in the way that we do things, but I mean, take a look at this podcast, trying to get this information out there to the end user, to the potential Air Force officer so that they know what direction that they can go and the steps that they need to take to get there. That's incredibly difficult. Yeah. And I think historically the system has worked. And, you know, we've talked about some of the benefits, right? The broad swath of experience and things. But the trouble is we're not sure that the system as is, is built to create the right training environment, to create the right kind of leaders. Yeah. And I don't know that the system can keep us on the forefront of where we need to be. We need to train the right leaders for the future. Future conflicts are coming. And we want to throw out some of our own recommendations on how we think we can make it better. And huge caveat, Colin, this is probably the most pie in the sky thing we have ever mentioned on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. This would require massive, massive overhaul of the entire Department of Defense and the military services. We're going to throw out centuries of tradition. Like, this is a big change. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but as we start going through some of the things we're recommending, I think your eyes are all going to get big. I certainly know that when I say this in public company, it gets real quiet real fast. <laughs> but, but we think that having this kind of discussion is exactly what's required to get to the better truth. Let's talk about all the ideas. Let's get them out there. We need to be agile. We need to be that lethal fighting force our nation needs. And we've got to accelerate some change or we're not going to have the people we need. So Colin, with that, let's get to some of these big ideas. And first on the chopping block, Colin, drum roll. What's first? The bachelor's degree. Yes. Yes. So we've talked about this before, how we recognize the value of a bachelor's degree, but we don't see it as a good requirement for Air Force officers. Why does somebody need to have gone to a four-year institution to be able to carry the responsibility of commission? What is it about a bachelor's degree that is going to qualify them for the special trust and confidence 
necessary to serve the nation. And we cannot make that connection. We can't draw a line between those two dots. And so we think that getting rid of the bachelor's degree requirement is step number one in this massive overhaul change that we are recommending here. Yeah. And I've talked about this with some of my peers, and the first reaction is incredibly visceral and violent in many ways. <laughs> and I think it's because people associate themselves so, so tightly with their degree yeah. and with their commissioning experience. Yep. For so many, those two things cannot be separate. Those three things, themselves, their commission, and their bachelor's degree, they cannot separate those. They are completely intertwined. And so I have to, you know, caveat again, I am not saying an education is not important. Right. At all. At all. That was an incredibly important, significant event in my life. Would not be who I am without it. I'm not saying we don't value that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. We're just saying I cannot see the tie between developing leaders of moral character and a four-year degree from a university. I just can't do it. Right. I can't do it. Now, I do think that it should be required in order to make 04. And we think a master's degree should be required for 06. Education matters. Yeah. And we're going to show that as we go through some of our discussions on this episode and in the future. But it's not a requirement for people to give you their followership. That's the problem. It is not something that is required for others to say, I want to follow that person. Because they went to school, the enlisted corps don't buy it. Yeah, absolutely. They're not buying it. And so I don't think we should either. We're not that special. Let, you know, so that's the first thing. So that's got to go. Yeah. And an argument can be made that the bachelor's degree fits in within our three C's model under the competence piece of it, that it has nothing to do with character or connection. Okay. I, I, I get you. It may belong under competence. Okay. So if that's the case, then let's recognize that we have enlisted airmen who are that competent. They have their bachelor's degree already. Many or master's or right. PhD. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And so if we value that piece of competence, then let's pay for it, right? Exactly. And that leads us to our next point. We're going to pay for what we value. If you have a degree, you're going to get paid for it to the point that it would be as if you were working on the outside with your degree. We're going to pay you so that it's worth your time to be an airman. So and this counts for our medical, this counts for legal. I don't care if you're an airman basic, slick sleeve. If you have a degree and you're working for us as an airman, we're going to make it worth your time. Yeah. And on the same token, we're going to pay you for the jobs that we value. If you are doing a job that requires less training, less education, and is less difficult, you're not going to get paid as much as someone who's doing a harder job that requires more training and more experience, all rank and time and service being equal. That's another thing that is really hard and kind of strangles our service. Why would you, you know, go to all these advanced trainings for years? Why would you do all this really difficult stuff when the person doing a job that's significantly less difficult than you, less dangerous, you name it, is getting the exact same pay and benefits? Yeah. It's a retention problem. We have a problem. Yeah. And on the retention side of things, there is the selective retention bonus, the SRB, that does kind of address this a little bit, but that's reactionary. Let's do it up front. Let's pay for the things that we value. Yeah, absolutely. You're also going to get paid more as you make rank and we're going to pay more for the jobs we need, but we need to get out of this place where people decide to cross over to be an officer for the pay. Right. Yes. Officers are going to get paid more because they're making hard decisions, they're leading airmen, they're doing difficult jobs. But it needs to not be just because they went to college. And it kills me when I hear people say, I cross over for the pay. I, okay, I don't know, it just, it doesn't work for me. So I've got a scenario for you. I want you to imagine that there's a captain who has no college degree, but is a wicked good leader. They're doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Then I want you to imagine an E7 with a master's degree who's just crushing it at some really technical job. Let's pick linguist, right? Yeah. Let's pick Chinese linguist. Hard. I don't, I, if you speak Chinese, Colin? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Have you looked at it much? It's kind of hard. Just, yeah. just going to throw that out there. Can't read it. Okay. So it's a hard language. Let's imagine that someone has a master's degree in linguistics and has been doing their job for 18 years. I think that a captain who's leading a unit that has a, you know, an E7 with a master's degree who's been doing the job for 18 years, I think that captain should be making less money than that E7. I agree. And right now, that's virtually impossible. 
and it blows my mind a little bit. And so I think we need to separate and pay for the things we need a little bit more. Yeah. I got nothing more to say on that. I, mean, I love it so much. The, the idea that we measure and we pay for the things that we value is so good. The thought that does come to mind, though, is that this brings us more in line with what is happening in private industry, in the commercial world, the corporate space, that they pay for what they value. If you don't have a degree, but you have the ability to add value to the business, you know, through because of your knowledge of programming languages, or you're a, a technical laborer, like you do high voltage electricity or manufacturing or something along those lines, something that's super technical, then you can make buku bucks without having to have gone to a four-year institution or even a trade school. I mean, if you just grew up with that knowledge, taught yourself how to do something on YouTube, great, let's pay you for that, Yeah, right? Because spoiler alert, who are we competing with for the airmen? We're competing with the corporate world. Yeah. And they're kicking our butts. And Colin, I, I freaking hate losing. <laughs> in case anyone hasn't noticed, right? We're supposed to be kind of competitive and good at what we do. And I feel like we are absolutely losing this point. Yeah. We're absolutely losing this point. And people can see through it. Yeah, absolutely. Another thought that I just had is that making this change of eliminating the bachelor's degree requirement wouldn't cost the Air Force anything to implement. Just take it out of the AFI. Say, we no longer need it. Poof, it's gone. I suspect there may be more to it. I, I just feel like, you know, some representative in Congress or the Senate will say no or something. I, I'm with you, though. We set this rule. It's not in Title 10. Right. Right. It's not in Title 10, except under that number four, the special requirements instituted by the service. The point remains, though, we can do this. Yeah, we can do this. And yes, we recognize this will absolutely wreak havoc on how all of the commissioning sources are set up. I mean, the whole concept of, quote, a commissioning source is centered in and around the acquisition of a bachelor's degree. Yeah. It's the whole point of ROTC and the academy. That's what they are. They're an education commissioning thing. They're intertwined. Yeah. And so, yes, what we are recommending is getting rid of ROTC and repurposing the Air Force Academy into something entirely different. Blasphemy, Reed. <laughs> How dare you recommend that we get rid of Air Force ROTC and the academy as we know it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what you were saying earlier about like the room goes silent <laughs> because it's so far out there that it's really difficult to actually wrap your head around it. Yeah. That if you get rid of the bachelor's requirement, that enables you to then make the decision to get rid of two of the three commissioning sources. Yeah. There's no longer a need for ROTC or the academy. So... Let's have a further discussion about that. I mean, we've talked before about how the Air Force Academy it is right now kind of like the de facto spiritual home of the Air Force, that airmanship and air power is just kind of baked into the walls. It's seeping through the entire experience there. And so we had a discussion about the merits of moving the whole of Air University to the Air Force Academy. But we don't want to just stop there. We see that there's an opportunity here to take greater advantage of that location, those facilities, and all of the Air Force-ness that is built into that place to produce the kind of officers that the Air Force really needs. Yeah. So we need a commissioning source, and that commissioning source would be some variation of what OTS is today. And that would happen at the Air Force Academy. But key here. How do officers get there? They're going to get there through basic training and an enlistment. So what I think needs to go along with this is that not just our service, but for every military service, if you are joining that service, you are going to that service's basic training and you're going to enlist. No exceptions. There is no such thing as, but I'm special. I have a special skill and knowledge and I'm going to go in as an O3 to do something special. Don't care. Don't care. You're going to enlist and you're going to serve for a minimum period of about 18 months. And commanders are then going to nominate those individuals who have shown an aptitude and an interest in leading. They're not going to nominate their best technicians, although their best leaders may be their best technicians. 
they're going to nominate the people who've shown an aptitude and an interest in leading. Yeah. Emphasis here on the leadership side in order to qualify for that special trust and confidence of the commission. Yep. So again, the commissioning is going to be something like OTS, approximately six months in length. We're going to really focus on academics, on the Constitution, on government, joint operations, planning, logistics, support, budgets, acquisitions, practical military training. They're going to draw on experience. That was one of the most valuable things about OTS is people were drawing on experience. They understood so much about what it meant to be an airman already. And all this will be designed to demonstrate and to test their character, confidence, and connection. A really key thing here that we need to bring in is in this plan, there are no AFSCs reserved for officers. Yeah. That's a really critical point here. So what am I saying? Right now, the only people who can be pilots, except for a very small exception of enlisted aviators who fly the RQ-4, the Global Hawk, all pilots are officers. That's going to go away. There will be no AFSCs reserved for officers except for those that are for leadership positions like squadron commander and up. Bottom line, officers are leaders. Yes, they're going to have a trade. And yes, they're going to do that trade, but they're going to be doing it in their role as a leader. So enlisted pilots, you bet. Enlisted nuclear operators, 100%. Enlisted doctors, dentists, chaplains, lawyers, absolutely. I want the best pilot to be an E7 with 18 years in the experience who can't ride a bullet to save their life, but you better believe it, I want them on the stick because that's all they've done is fly. So yeah, it kind of upends things a little bit, but I want to separate this idea between officers being technicians. Yeah. Officers are leaders, and this is how we can separate those things. Yeah, absolutely. If we're talking about the ultimate goal of the commission is to produce a joint force commander, you need to have somebody who has been on the command track the entire time. Exactly. There is one track, command. That's the track. But this isn't to say that officers won't have a trade or that they won't have a, a technical competency, right, Reed? You're not saying that we're just focused on the leadership aspect and we don't know the business of the Air Force. Absolutely. There will be officer pilots, but they're going to be leading flights of enlisted aviators. Because that's what we want. We want to develop absolute lethal technicians who are incredibly competent, who are absolutely without question competent. And we're going to pay those folks for it, right? We're going to pay our enlisted aviators, our enlisted pilots more than we're going to pay an enlisted airman doing another job that we don't, quote, need as much. You know, and I say that very carefully, right? We need everybody doing every position. But who are we kidding? We need pilots. Yeah, I mean, it's a two-year pipeline to earn your wings where many of the other AIT pipelines, advanced individual training is just a matter of weeks. Exactly, right? exactly. Perfect case in point that we've talked about previously is the acquisitions career field. You know, that right now is reserved strictly for officers, but there's no reason why we couldn't have an, an enlisted airman doing it. But that acquisitions training is just a couple of weeks. Yeah, so this is going to take... A lot. And Colin, you and I, to be fair, we haven't worked out every detail with every career field, with every enlisted officer. Like we haven't sat down and broken out, you know, the CFETP for all of these, for example. Right. We, we right. absolutely. Yeah. We couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. We'd need a whole crew, you know, like here's a wing of the Pentagon and 300 people, you know, don't mess it up kind of thing. But. Can you imagine us being oh, <laughs> involved in that? We, we maybe shouldn't say that out loud. We, you know, like, be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> they'll, you know, send us, us to a, a life in the puzzle palace. But, um, <laughs> but the bottom line is we need officers who have no question about who they are. Yeah. Colin, I cannot believe that we have, like, intellectual debates about what an officer is. Are they a technician or are they a leader? Right. I cannot believe you will get in a group, you'll go to SOS and, you, and someone will ask this question. You'll have like a three hour discussion. I'm an Intel officer. That's what I do. Yep. I call bollocks. There are enlisted airmen, one and O's who went through a training program that's virtually identical and very often will do the exact same job as you, but you're getting paid twice, three times as much because you went to school. They know, they know. Yeah. They look at you and they go, that guy or gal is not any better than me at this job. 
but they're making three or four times as much. And for what? They know. Yeah. And so that guy or gal then makes the connection. Hey, if I finish my degree and I go get a commission, I can do the same job and get paid more. Which is not bad, right? We, again, we, I don't want to like totally poop on the existing system. It's the motivation. It's the why. That's what's got to change. We need to develop leaders who want to lead, who have an aptitude to lead. And whether or not you have a degree or not doesn't influence that at all. Yes, there's certain knowledge, skills, and abilities that you have to demonstrate. And education is valuable. We're going to pay you for that. Yeah. And, but yeah, that's the core of what we're talking about here. And the reason that we're here having this particular conversation is because up to this point, the Air Force has measured and valued that tactical, technical competence. And here we are trying to upend that piece of it. Yes, we still want to keep the competence piece of it. But we need to add in and strengthen the character and the connection of our Air Force officers so that they can qualify for the special trust and confidence of the American people, but also of the airmen, right? You keep going back to this, how the enlisted see us for what we really are, which is just an, an overpaid technician. And that needs to not be the case. They need to see us as a leader of airmen who has all those requirements, the technical competence, the connection with them and other airmen, and the character that is going to support all of the decisions that we make so that they can give us their gift of followership. Yeah. Or give us the gift of our leadership. Yeah. You remind me, Colin, of this experience. And I think I've shared this before. If I haven't, I'll do it now. I had been commissioned four or five weeks. You know, I'm young. I didn't even have my clearance yet at my work. And I was like sitting in the basement. We called it the leper colony, right? Like <laughs> I'm unclean. Like I just kind of sit down there and just stay out of trouble, basically. I was walking out of work, headed home, and the wing commander and their command chief were walking by me. So I, you know, very sharply salute the wing commander. And then after I dropped my salute, the command chief saluted me. And I returned that salute. And while I understood it, it just has never sat well with me. And I don't want to. You know, I'm not all for breaking down the rank structure. I think the ranks matter. I think they're important. But I did not feel that I merited that. I didn't feel that I had done anything to warrant it. And, and I don't want to say deserve because I don't think anyone ever deserves it. It just has never sat well with me. Yeah. And that's what we're kind of getting at. And Colin, you know, you mentioned something about competence. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, our former chief of staff, General Goldfein, now retired, gave an interview recently where he straight up says that the Air Force has focused historically too much on competence and not enough on character. And, you know, we'll provide a link to that interview in the show notes. It's a fantastic interview that he did for a YouTube video. It's really, really good. But that's the key, right? We need people of character and connection. And right now, our training programs don't. They don't. They don't focus on that. Yeah. And, you know, Reed, I have half a mind to end right there, but I think there's one more piece that I think we should address, and that would be the length of this training program that we're proposing. And let's couch it in the opportunity to display and demonstrate and even grow and develop that character and connection piece to produce officers who have character and connection in addition to their competence, which they had already gained through their at least 18 months of service as an enlisted airman, right? Yeah. Because you mentioned that the current proposed training program would be at least six months long. And this stands in contrast to the current way that we produce officers. Yes, four years at Air Force ROTC or the Academy, but really only 14 days give or take of that common field training experience for the cadets in ROTC. And then the eight to 12 weeks of being in officer training school, we're proposing something significantly longer than that. And something that's far more grueling, far more difficult to get through in this new way of doing things, this refreshed, relocated officer training school being six months. Why six months? And how does that get us to having officers who have all three pieces, competence, character, and connection? So one of my biggest complaints about OTS is 
it's not long enough to test an individual's ability to connect with others. Anybody can do almost anything for eight, even 12 weeks, including completely ignore serious interpersonal challenges that are happening within the flight right. or within the cadet squadrons and wings. And Colin, if you remember from you know our team lessons that we gave when we were instructors, the four stages of development, forming, norming, storming, and performing. And if you remember from that lesson, storming is the most important stage in the entire experience. Yeah. It's also the most developmentally difficult stage. And I never one time in all of my years at OTS had a flight get all the way through storming and make it to the performing phase. Right. I never did. I had fantastic students that worked really hard. They started to form their teams and then they started to norm. And norming usually is, you know, the kind of leaders kind of shake out, people kind of start filling their roles and they even start to experience some success. Yeah. But they never had to get through the garbage of dealing with that roommate who snores or whatever the stupid reason that they don't get along with somebody. They didn't have to. I remember on my first deployment, there was an individual that for whatever reason, I just had a challenge connecting with them. Yeah. They were in a position of leadership. I worked for them. It was an important relationship. It took months of deliberate, conscious effort to get through our storming phase till I understood that this person didn't dislike me, that they just had a slightly different personality than me. And it took a long time of conscious effort. I mean, no joke. I had notes written out in a notebook about our personal interactions so I could figure out what was going on so I could get through it. But Colin, when we got on the backside of that, we could basically read each other's minds. Right. We would be given a wicked hard problem. We would look at each other and just start bouncing ideas off each other and we'd get these plans out and they'd get pushed and people are like, wow, that's really good. I'm like, yeah, because we're a team. That is hard, <laughs> Colin. It's hard. Yeah. And right now, I do not believe that OTS does that. I just don't think it's long enough. Yeah. And I would make the same argument for ROTC. Yes, it's four years long. Certainly, they don't get through the storming phase at field training. Just not long enough. You can't do that in 14 days. But I would make the same argument for the whole of ROTC in general because the people who come in and out of the program change so frequently that there's really no opportunity for them to ever move beyond the storming stage. They can get there for sure, but they don't ever really get to the norming phase. And on top of that, within ROTC, the vast majority of the cadets that are in there have no Air Force context. They've never served in the military before. And so they're just kind of making things up, pulling things out of the air. Yes, we as cadre are providing some recommendations, but we're at a university and we're strapped for resources. We don't have a flight line that we can go and point and look at. This is an aircraft and this is how it interacts with a hangar or something along those lines, right? And so there's no real opportunity for them to get out of the storming stage into the norming phase and certainly not to the performing stage. Or to put any of their training in context. That was the most valuable thing my prior enlisted could provide. The, the non-priors in our training environment was a context. I did my best, but I'm one person. Yeah. Now imagine your roommates and the entire room next door and that one guy or gal across the hall. They provided context for everything, and it makes the training a much more valuable experience. Yeah. Now imagine if everyone has the context. Different context, because they're going to come from different career fields, right? Yeah. But everybody has that foundation of having gone through BMT. They've spent at least 18 months in an enlisted profession, becoming that competent technical expert. And now we're going to add in that character piece of it and that connection piece of it that can only be gained through an extended training event, such as a six month pipeline. Yeah. And that's one of the things I do want to say, I think the Air Force Academy does better Yeah, is the concentrated, challenging environment of extremely high performing individuals for such a prolonged period of time. That's one of the reasons I think that's a special place. And that's kind of what I want to tap into. Yeah. And frankly, why do they get all of it? I think they should spread the wealth a little bit and just change the way it looks and feels so that we can all make a single uniform, much more uniform product. 
So there you go, Colin. Uniform product and better product, right? I think so. I do. And again, we're approaching this very carefully. And I really want to point out, we are not calling out the entire officer corps of the United States Air Force. We're not doing that. Colin, you and I are products of that system. So in a sense, we're calling ourselves out. Yeah. We want to do this as best as possible. And we think there are some shortfalls. We think there are some areas we can improve. And we think the American people and the future conflicts that we are going to face deserve that quality and caliber of officer. And we think it can be better. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to make it better. I mean, how dare we stay stagnant, right? And just say, you know, what we've always done is good enough. We haven't lost any air wars. And so the model that we've been working with is sufficient. We have covered that that is not necessarily going to always be the case. We are not always going to be the best in the skies. Air dominance is not a birthright of the American people. We have to go out and earn it. And this is one way that we feel that we can make steps to ensure that success in the future. Yep. And we're not done yet. This is just a starting point. So if you already thought our crazy flag was hanging out, um, you just wait. We've got a couple more ideas <laughs> that we're going to be presenting um, over the next few weeks. Because uh, the commission is just the beginning, yeah. right? It is not the destination. That was a pretty common thing I would give in a graduation speech, right? You know, yes, celebrate this day, be excited. But this is just the entry point. Yep. You're just starting on your journey. Uh, so next, we're going to finish a series of episodes discussing how we should develop officers for command and eventually for that position as a joint force commander. Yeah, absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground. We still have more to go. We have received some great feedback already on the stuff that we have put out on what an officer should be, the evaluation system. We continue to invite that feedback. We know we don't have this 100% right. And that's okay. Again, we're putting something out there for the purpose of discussion so that we can accelerate the changes necessary to produce the officers that the Air Force needs. So reach out to us, send us your thoughts to Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com, send us your messages on social media, join us in the Heritage Room. Go to Air Force Officer Podcast.com and join the Heritage Room. Let's have a discussion there. Let's bounce ideas back and forth and make sure that the requirements that we establish in order to get into this club actually make sense. And the way that we meet those requirements actually produce the results that we need. We can't do this on our own. You and I, Reed, we're just a couple of guys, just a couple of officers. We don't have the authority to make these changes, but we do own a piece of this. We do own the responsibility to have these discussions and get this information in front of the people who can make these decisions so that we can continually improve our Air Force for our airmen, for ourselves, and for ultimately for the American people. Yep. And to anybody out there who's been working hard to get their degree so that they can make some more money for their family, keep doing it. Right. You know, I don't, I don't want anyone to feel disparaged in any way for their goals, for their perspectives, for the attitudes that they have. We're all products of the system that we've grown up in. I want you to keep working hard and develop those things. You are worth it, as are the people you love and the people you serve. This is our humble approach to how we think it could be better. And, you know, again, Colin, as you mentioned, we love it when we hear from our audience. And Colin, I think that wraps it up for this week. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed.